Hi, hello again and welcome back to my channel. Thank you so much for clicking on this video. I hope you enjoy. Today, we will be covering the disappearance of Sarah and Jacob Hoggle, who went missing in 2014 from Maryland in the USA. Catherine Hoggle and Troy Turner met at a restaurant that they both were working at. Troy was a bouncer and she was a waitress. They soon after welcomed their first child in 2008. By 2014, 27-year-old Catherine and 41-year-old Troy had three children together. A son, aged 5, a daughter, aged 3, and another son, aged 2. They were, however, never married. Catherine had a long history, beginning as a teenager, of mental illness, including depression and bouts of mania. It was around 2008, after she had her first baby, that Troy started realizing that her mental state might be declining. During this time, they started arguing more and she acted more erratically at times. At first, he put most of it down to the stresses of becoming a new parent. But it was after the birth of their second and third child in 2010 and 2012 that she started acting paranoid. She started worrying that people were watching them and started saying that people want to perform exorcisms on her. She also started hoarding things and even hung dishes over the doorknobs so that she could hear the people that she believed would break into their house. She had also at one point taken out a restraining order against her sister-in-law, saying that she was following her everywhere, which was not the case at all. In early 2013, the couple's relationship ended, and Troy and her parents sought a court-ordered psychiatric evaluation for Catherine. Catherine was then involuntarily committed to a mental hospital twice between 2013 and 2014. Both times, she had received inpatient treatment at Shepherd Pratt, and there she was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. She was then put on medication and evaluated more during her stay there. As she made enough improvement, she was released and deemed competent after around 30 days. And the second time, she was released after around 60 days and also deemed competent. Troy stated that Catherine's mom made it clear that Catherine could not come back and stay at her place. And decided that she would then move into his apartment in Clarksburg, Maryland. With him and the kids, as she had no other place to go. He had not been in a relationship with Catherine since before she had been committed for the first time. But he felt that it was important for his kids to have their mother in their lives. And he also wanted to give her the opportunity to be a mother to them. It was said that Catherine was a great and very attentive mother when her mental state was sound. But she acted erratically and unpredictably when it wasn't. He said that his whole thought process was to have Catherine stay with them and to find the best and healthiest way to keep her in their lives while she continued seeking treatment to get better. And that when he felt she was better, she would then get her own place. Catherine was enrolled into a day treatment program and she continued with regular visits and therapy sessions with her doctors. And as far as everyone knew, she continued taking her medication. Although she had been making really good progress, both Troy and her doctor felt that due to the, her delusions and paranoia that she suffered from, and looking back at her history, that it was not safe to leave her alone with the children. Troy had set up schedules for babysitters or with his family or hers to watch out for both Catherine and the kids when he would not be home or at work. Catherine's father, Randy, also periodically stayed with them as they needed.
on the 7th of September 2014. The family of five attended their oldest son's soccer match and afterward they went to a park. It was a happy, fun-filled day, one of the best and most stable they have had in a very, very long time, and Troy took plenty of pictures to commemorate it. He unfortunately had to go to work at around 2 p.m., and he left Catherine and her three kids at the apartment with her father Randy. When he left, the kids were playing with blocks in the living room and watching TV. He kissed all three of them goodbye and told them that he'll see them later and he sets off for work. Not much later, Randy drove all of them to her mother, his ex-wife, Lindsay's house, to spend the afternoon. She lived in Gaithersburg, Maryland, which was about 15 miles from the apartment that they lived in. Lindsay had gone out for a brief period of time that day, as an old friend of hers was in town. And according to her, she had the weekend off from grandma duty. So she left Catherine and the kids at her house under the supervision of Catherine's father, Randy. While Lindsay was out, Around 4 p.m., Catherine asked Randy for the keys to his car and told him that she wanted to take her youngest son, two-year-old Jacob, to go and get pizza. Now, I don't quite know why, because from all accounts that I could find, her parents were very aware that she should not be left alone, unsupervised with the kids, and also that she should not drive. But for some reason, he agrees to this and hands her the keys, and she leaves her mother's house with Jacob, leaving both Sarah and her oldest son with Randy. Catherine's mom, Lindsay, returned a little while later and expressed concern when she saw that Catherine was gone because A, she was alone with Jacob, and B, she was driving, which the doctor had advised against with the effect that her medication sometimes had on her and she also no longer had a driver's license. Randy then went off attempting to look for her but didn't find her and returned to Lindsay's house and waited for her to return. She finally returned around 7 p.m. after being gone for almost three hours. Her parents felt huge amounts of relief when they saw her pulling into the yard but they saw that she returned without a pizza or Jacob and they were puzzled. She explained to them that she had dropped Jacob off to spend the night with a friend, a known acquaintance to them, so they didn't question it further. They accepted this explanation and decided not to notify Troy of what had happened. She and the other two kids remained with her parents at Lindsay's house and at around 9.30pm, Randy drove them back to Troy's apartment and stayed there with them until Troy had returned. Troy returned home from work at around 12 that night. He had a routine when he returned home, where he would usually check on the kids first before going to bed. But that night, he saw Catherine outside on the steps of the apartment building when he got home. She said that she needed to go to McDonald's to get a Dr. Pepper, because the medication was making her sluggish. It wasn't something rare or unusual. The caffeine and the sugar in the soda helped with her symptoms. He asked her whether Randy, who was upstairs with the kids, knew that they were gone. And she said yes, she told him. So they left and when they came back, Troy still had to take groceries out from the car. And it was around 1am where he would finally get settled into the apartment. So that night, he didn't follow his normal routine and was particularly exhausted. Catherine had by that time already fallen asleep on the couch. The two of them would switch out where they would sleep. If she was on the couch, he would sleep in the bed, and if she was in the bed, he would sleep on the couch. So he decided to go straight to bed without checking in on the kids first as he usually did. He did however notice that two-year-old Jacob was not in his crib when he got into the room. But he didn't make much of it, as Jacob often got out of his crib and crawled into bed with his older brother when he could not sleep. So, Troy also went to sleep.
That next morning, on the 8th of September, he was woken up by his older son, around 20 minutes earlier than he usually got up, which was strange. He got out of bed to start getting ready for the day, but he didn't see Catherine, Sarah or Jacob around. He also noticed that Randy was not there either, and that his car keys and his wallet was missing. He immediately phoned her parents who did not know where she was. He was panicked but tried to hide it because he did not want to worry his older son. He got him ready for school and walked him to the bus stop. He walked home and had just called 911 to report Catherine, Jacob and Sarah as missing but he saw Catherine driving up in his van, alone, while still on the phone with the 911 operator. Catherine told him not to panic and that she had dropped both Sarah and Jacob off at a new daycare center. She said she wanted them to try it out for the day to see whether they would like it. The one day visit was something that they had done with their older son before enrolling him in a daycare and were talking about doing the same thing with the two younger kids. So this eased his panic a bit and he wanted to give Catherine the benefit of the doubt since she had been doing so much better but he was still not completely comfortable with the situation. By this point, no one had told Troy that Jacob hadn't technically been seen since the previous day or about the supposed sleepover that Jacob had gone to. At around 11, he went to drop Catherine off at a pre-scheduled medical appointment and returned to pick her up around 2 p.m. He was feeling more and more uneasy about the whole situation by this point and was eager to see his kids and the daycare so he could see for himself whether it would be a good fit for them. They went to pick up their oldest son from the bus stop and Troy suggested to Catherine that they pick up Jacob and Sarah as well. He asked her for the address of the school and she couldn't remember. He asked her for the name of the school and she couldn't remember. Then he asked her for the phone number and she gave the same answer. She couldn't remember. Troy started getting upset at the fact that she placed their kids somewhere without even knowing the name or phone number of the place. She then told him that they do have her number. He was getting more and more upset and panicked, but with their oldest son in the car, he tried not to freak out completely. Troy phoned Catherine's mother to come and pick up their oldest son, which she did. When Catherine found out that her mother was coming to pick up their older son. Her mood suddenly shifted and she became very upset and angry. When her mom arrived, she was yelling at her and calling her all sorts of names. Troy put his son in Lindsay's car and told Lindsay to just leave and go. As Lindsay was pulling away, Catherine started hitting and kicking the back of her car and continued screaming profanities at her. He told Catherine to get in the car and he started driving in the direction of the police station in Germantown so that they could get involved because obviously Catherine seemed to have no idea where their kids were. When she realized they were driving towards the police station, she all of a sudden claimed to have remembered the daycare where the children had been left and that it was located a few miles away in Damascus, Maryland. She then suggested that they go there before going to the police station. Troy seemed to calm down by that point and he felt like he could now breathe a sigh of relief. On the way, Catherine asked whether they could first stop at a restaurant so that she could get a soda. This again was an, an abnormal request with Catherine's medication often making her drowsy and sugary caffeinated drinks usually helped. So they stopped at a Chick-fil-A as she had requested. They went to get her a soda and she also went to the bathroom and she stayed in there for quite some time. While in the bathroom, she texted her mom to tell her, don't worry, the kids are okay. She came out of the bathroom after some time and they returned to the car. She had finished her soda by this time and told Troy that she was still feeling drowsy and wanted to run back in to quickly get a refill before they left. He agreed to this and told her that he would wait for her in the car. He sat in the car waiting for her to come back but realized that it was taking way longer than it should. 
he got out and went back in to check, worried that something might have happened, like maybe she might have fainted in the bathroom or something. But Catherine was nowhere to be seen. She had left the restaurant through another door and disappeared. Once Catherine disappeared, Troy immediately got the police involved. He told the police that his two children had gone missing first and that their mother had now also gone missing. It was only then that he learned that Jacob had in fact gone missing the night before when he heard Lindsay speaking to the police. He asked her why he was not informed of what had happened and she said that Randy was supposed to tell him as it was her weekend off of grandma duty. He asked his five-year-old son whether Sarah was at the apartment the night before when they returned home and he confirmed that she was definitely still there when he went to bed. So that meant that Sarah disappeared from Clarksburg, Maryland from the apartment at some point between when they got home and everyone waking up in the morning. This meant that the two children disappeared from two different areas at two different times. These locations are located close enough to each other that it's entirely possible that both of the children ended up in the same location though. It is also possible that Jacob was in one location temporarily and whenever Sarah disappeared she and Jacob were reunited, at which point they went to a different location altogether. And now Catherine was gone to from the restaurant in Germantown. Over that next few hours, the multiple different stories that Catherine had told people began to emerge, leading everyone to realize that there was no clear timeline on the disappearances, and that only further complicated the situation. A search for the kids and Catherine soon ensued, starting with a bloodhound search for Catherine with the police thinking that she might have gone to wherever she had taken the kids. Once nothing was found within 12 hours of her disappearance, major crimes got involved. Missing posters went out, police went out in the media, and several more searches were done. Four days after she disappeared, Catherine was spotted walking along down a street in Germantown by someone who recognized her photo from the news. Police were called and although she briefly tried to get away, she was successfully taken into custody, still wearing the same clothing that she was wearing on the day she ran out of the Chick-fil-A restaurant. Police believe that Catherine had stayed in the Germantown area for the four days that she was missing. But they had no idea where she might have been hiding out. When she was questioned about the children's whereabouts, 
She had first told the police that she had left them with an old high school friend named Erin. When they asked for the additional details like what Erin's last name was, or where she was staying, or even a phone number, she became more and more vague, providing no clear answers. Later, she changed her story, saying that she left the kids alone at a local park, near her mother's house. She then offered to take the police to the park, which they went to because of course it might be true. Even though she had been telling several lies continuously, they had to check it out. They then went to the park, but they found no signs of the children or any evidence that they had in fact been there. Police think that she was actually just looking for a way to escape, and once she realized that she would not be able to get away, she gave up the idea, and she started wanting to take them around to other places, which they did not give in to. Police indicated that Catherine seemed completely lucid that day when they spoke to her. She did not seem out of it or unaware of what was going on at all. They also got her mother, her father, Troy and four different investigators to talk to her and they even had a psychologist advising them what they should do and what they should ask her or how they should approach her. But she would still not give them any information on the whereabouts of the children. She then had an attorney come in and she spoke to them alone for quite some time. When her attorneys came out, they spoke to the state's attorney and told him that the children were safe and they faced no further harm. Some people speculate that that meant that the children were already dead. After the wild goose chase that she tried to lead them on and no clear information provided by her, she was placed under arrest and charged with a misdemeanor for child neglect and preventing the course of justice. She was kept in jail for around two days, but due to extensive mental health history, she was moved to a mental health facility where she would remain until she could be declared fit to stand trial. In the months following Sarah and Jacob's disappearance, there were extensive searches for the children with a wide area of territory covered, including wooded areas and suburban areas, and the search even moved to some of the adjacent counties. Police also traced what they could from Catherine's cellular activity from the days the children disappeared, but unfortunately, with all of these efforts, they did not find any trace of the kids or any evidence to help push the investigation along. Since Sarah and Jacob were first reported missing, Montgomery County police search teams have scoured over 20,000 acres in Montgomery County looking for them. Police have also asked residents in the Up County to search their own private property lines for signs of the children. So far, police say there's been no sign of them. My MC Media's Krista Brick joins us from police headquarters with more. Krista? I'm at the public safety headquarters where police have been working nonstop to try to find these kids. It's a heartbreaking story with a mother in jail and her two toddlers still missing. We keep a ray of hope that uh, Sarah, and Jack, Sarah and Jacob are still out there uh, and, and can be reunited with their family. But what I will tell you at this point, what we are doing is we're transitioning our operations uh, as investigators. The nightmare for this family started on September 7th when Catherine Hoggle told her parents she took two-year-old Jacob out for pizza and returned without him. She said she left him at a friend's house for a sleepover. The next day, she told their father she dropped both Sarah and Jacob at a new daycare in the area, but couldn't remember anything about it. That's when Turner got worried, and Catherine and he headed to the police station to report the children missing. The two stopped at a Chick-fil-A restaurant along the way, and Catherine Hoggle disappeared. Worried for his daughter and his grandchildren, Randy Hoggle begged her to come home. Everyone here is committed to, if you just come and get help, we'll all help you. And for that, I just want to say, please come home. We miss you, and we miss the kids. Hoggle was spotted by a citizen four days later in Germantown. Described by police as having dirt under her fingernails, two missing persons posters about her kids, and a shorter haircut. Major crimes investigators uh, interviewed her for 15 hours. We, uh, I will tell you, some of the best inve investigators on this department went in to talk with her. And our first and pretty much only question was, where are Jacob and where are Sarah? 
court documents outline several tales Catherine Hoggle told, at one point saying she dropped them with a friend in Bethesda, and at other times saying she left them at a Germantown park. But just what happened to those two small children is still unanswered, and the search continues. Hoggle was arrested September 12th in connection with their disappearance and won't tell anyone where they are. Scores of search teams scour wooded areas from Clarksburg to Germantown, looking for any signs of the missing children. Friends passed out flyers, others flew search missions by air. So far, they've come up empty. Catherine was held at the Clifton T. Perkins Hospital after she was charged with a misdemeanor stemming from the disappearance of her children in 2014. Whilst there, she had attacked other patients and she has tried to escape at least eight times by grabbing the security's badge or a staff member's badge and running towards the door. No court trial could proceed if Catherine was not deemed fit to stand trial. What that means is that she needs to be able to understand what is going on in the trial and have meaningful discussions and inputs with her lawyers. Affidavits from Troy, the Gitt's father, Catherine's mother and aunt were presented to the courts initially, saying that she might not be as incompetent as it seemed. Catherine understands precisely what is going on, wrote her mother Lindsay Hoggle, who added that her daughter's IQ was once tested at 135. Unfortunately, this failed. Unfortunately, this failed as doctors treating her declared her as unfit to stand trial for the first time in 2015. She wanted to show the police where the kids were. Um, I asked her how come she doesn't show me I'm their father, I could pick them up. And then she just said that um, it wouldn't do anything for her to show me that she needed to show the police herself. No, that was a complete act today. She sounded nothing like that on any of our phone conversations, on any other conversations I've heard. Um, that, that was an act. Either that was an act or they medicated her right before they came here. And that's how she sounds whenever the medication makes her groggy and stuff. It wouldn't shock me if they did something like that even. What's your opinion of the judge's ruling on this? Um, I think that, I think he made it without hearing from some of the right people. I mean, I would have liked to have had my say. Um, I think that he's, he's going off of, he, do, he doesn't have enough information to decide one way or another. So, I mean, uh, but he does what he does. It's not up to me, so. You still have hope? Oh, about them being alive? Oh, no, I believe that. Period. Yeah, if I didn't, I wouldn't be standing here, you know? I'd, I'd be somewhere else broken down. It doesn't surprise me. I think um, the point that Troy made that's most important here is that Catherine um, is afraid of being charged further and going back to jail. She's now finally realizing that she does have a mental illness. She feels safe at Perkins. She wants to stay at Perkins. Two months ago, when she was here, she um, was wanting to be competent. That has taken a nosedive since two months ago. She's afraid of being sent to jail. And somewhere along the line, we've got to change the laws where we treat mental illness at the right facility. Um, she's very competent. She's very capable of being competent. Um, she, whether she's taking antipsychotic psychotic drugs or not, she's not taking the right mix yet and the right place. And she's very capable of being competent sooner rather than later. She understands the situation. The problem is she doesn't want to go to jail. It's as simple as that. So, that's okay. So do you think that's having an impact on one moving forward with the case and how open she's being, that fear of going to jail? Absolutely. She, to she told me that. And, and I think it's, um, it, you know, it, again, she made a, a conscious decision after the last hearing um, for fear that she would be sent to jail. And somewhere along the line, that's got to be made clear to her what the charges are going to be, if they are. And uh, somewhere along the line, uh, make a change in the law where it keeps her at Perkins, which is where she belongs. That's where she needs to stay. So what Troy is saying, are you agreeing with that? For what I heard, yes. Oh. That, that he, that she's very, she's close to being competent. 
Um, she's not completely there yet. She is not unrecoverable or whatever the word is. She's very capable, but she's afraid of going to jail. How difficult is this as a, as a mother, seeing your daughter, knowing her struggles, and thinking of her grandchildren at the same time? You know, my message to Catherine is the same that I've made since day one. I am here for you. I will stay with you whatever we have to do to solve the mystery of Sarah and Jacob. And I will talk to anybody I have to talk to to find these children, to find out what happened. And so she knows that, you know, I, I, I'm going to keep that word. I'm still here for Sarah and Jacob. It's like Troy said, we've got to remember this is not... Um, a minor situation. There are still two children that we don't know where they are. And so um, I appreciate everybody who's just keeping their faces out there. Uh, you know, we're not going to stop, we're not going to lose momentum until we find them. How, how do you think our lawyers? Maryland has laws that limit how long someone can be held under a charge with the goal of them becoming competent for court. These laws were created to avoid legislative purgatory where someone might find themselves held under a charge indefinitely without having due process and access to a trial. The time limit that someone can be held while being deemed incompetent, with the goal of them being restored to competency, is 10 years for those accused of capital crimes, 5 years for a felony or violent crime, and for other crimes, the limit is 3 years. By 2017, Catherine was still deemed as incompetent to stand trial. This was also the year where her three-year limit that she could be held for her misdemeanor charges approached. After years of court battles on her mental competency and still with no details provided by her on the children's whereabouts, on 14 September 2017, prosecutors indicted her and upgraded her charges to two counts of felony murder. Them. 30 year old Catherine Hoggle faced a judge in Montgomery County Circuit Court today on two counts of first degree murder. Here's Sarah and Jacob's father, Troy Turner. Please keep my family, Sarah and Jacob, in your prayers. I hope with the charges handed down today, we're moving closer to getting justice for them, and that's what it needs to be about from beginning to end and justice for my babies. The judge ordered Hoggle held without bond and transferred back to Clifton T. Perkins, the state psychiatric hospital where she's been locked up for the last three years, something the state and Hoggle's own attorney asked for. We understand that what was going to happen today, it, we weren't fighting it. Um, our biggest concern is to make sure that she, she is treated for her mental health issues. We knew this was coming, I mean, under Maryland law, so it was really no surprise, and Mr. McCarthy made me aware of that. So, you know, at some point, I think we have to have something nudge this forward. Development spurred not by new evidence, but rather state law. Hoggle's been in custody all this time after being ruled incompetent to stand trial on misdemeanor charges connected to the case, which were about to expire. The new murder charges ensure Hoggle stays locked up. I can't talk to you about a, a trial date or a motions date in this case because everything essentially is on hold until we get to a point where doctors say she is competent to stand trial and we're not there right now. The county state's attorney also said today, according to reports he's received over the years from Perkins, Catherine Hoggle has repeatedly attempted to escape from the hospital. Her next court date is September 29th. At the time, she did not enter a plea due to the fact that she was still found to be not fit to stand trial. And the next hearing for competency was set for November 2018. Police at that time stated that with the amount of time that had passed, with still no sign of the children anyway, or any evidence that they were still alive, they believed that the children had passed away. They said that due to the sheer magnitude of press coverage on the case, they found it unlikely that someone would want to keep the children and be involved in such a situation with the chance of them being found. Of Catherine, they said, at any time she could have given information on the children's whereabouts. The case would have been resolved and the children would have been reunited with their family. But that has not happened. And that just further strengthens the belief 
that the children were no longer alive. Catherine's mother, Lindsay, stated that she can with 100% certainty say that she does not believe that Catherine would have ever hurt her children. She said that every time she spoke to Catherine about it, Catherine had said, yeah, I had a plan. They are with someone, but I'm not going to tell you where they are. Lindsay said that she has never varied from that story. Lindsay also said that she has scoured her daughter's emails, texts and phone records to try and find any information, but she believes the children are safe and her daughter knows where they are. She said that she thinks that Catherine probably has a group of people who may have taken the kids. She also made it known that even though she loves her daughter very much, she has never condoned what Catherine had done and that she wanted her children found just as much as anyone else and that what happened was unfair to everyone involved, especially their older brother. The possibility of someone taking the kids and hiding them per se was not entirely dismissed by investigators. They stated that they were aware of underground networks that hide children when they believe that it would be in the best interest of the children. And if that was the case, they would continue searching for them until they are found. Her attorney has continued to state that he cannot answer on whether he knows what happened to Sarah and Jacob due to client attorney privilege and the ethical behavior that is required from an attorney representing a client. Troy had continued pushing search efforts and spearheaded several searches and passed out thousands and thousands of flyers over the years. He had also launched a Facebook campaign to spread the word and collect clues, but none of this has brought them any resolution. By the time of the indictment in 2017, Troy had also come to believe that Sarah and Jacob were no longer alive. He said that he tried to take the emotion out of it and look at it logically, which has of course been very difficult when thinking of his own children. He however stated that he still wants to know what happened to them and said that to some people it will always remain a mystery until Catherine tells the truth. But with the passage of time, he knows Catherine killed his babies. He said, I am their father and they will always be close to my heart. My job is to find my kids and bring them home, no matter what condition they are in. After the indictment, they also released a statement on Facebook saying, Thank you for all the support the last three years, for keeping awareness of Sarah and Jacob out there. We understand a lot of you have strong feelings about Sarah and Jacob. We do too. However, based on the passage of time, information we have and Catherine's own statements, we no longer believe that Sarah and Jacob are alive. With the pending murder charges against Catherine, it wouldn't be appropriate for us to be more specific. And for that we are sorry. We are still committed to bringing them home, but the searches will have a different focus. We hope you continue to support us and help us in the upcoming searches. Troy stated that he will always keep up his search for answers, while also consoling and supporting the couple's oldest child, who understands that he might never again see his younger siblings. He states that he will always remain with the what-ifs of that night, and it will forever haunt him. When speaking of Sarah, he describes her as his tomboy princess, because she loved wrestling with her father and brothers as much as she loved playing with her dollhouse in her pink bedroom with purple accents. He describes Jacob as the sweetest soul ever born, so affectionate and compassionate even at his young age, that when his older siblings were put in time out, Jacob would go and sit with them so they wouldn't be lonely. Oh, this just makes me so emotional. My heart just breaks for this father and everyone that knew and loved these kids. Every evaluation since the indictment has found that Catherine was dangerous and unable to assist in her own defense. In the most recent evaluations, it was found that she is now unresorable. In January 2020, on the fifth anniversary of Catherine first being found incompetent, 
her attorney filed a motion arguing that the charges against her should be dropped. Every county courtroom today where a judge will consider dismissing the case against Catherine Hoggle, who is charged with the murders of her two young children. It's a mysterious case that Fox 5 has been leading the way on from the start. Their dad is here with us and will join us in just a minute. But first, let's get you caught up on the timeline. Back in 2014, two-year-old Jacob and three-year-old Sarah went missing. Their mother, Catherine Hoggle, is charged with misdemeanors. Then in 2015, a judge rules Hoggle incompetent to stand trial. She's diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. In 2017, Hoggle is indicted on two murder charges. Various proceedings continue for the next two years. Then, just last month, the defense filed a motion to dismiss the case, citing a Maryland law that limits the amount of time a defendant can be held if they're found incompetent to stand trial. And while this plays out in courts, there is still no trace of Jacob and Sarah. This morning, their father, Troy Turner, joins us in studio. Um, Troy, as you have throughout the years, being an advocate for your missing children. Good morning. Good morning. Um, an emotional day. Yes. How are you feeling going into this hearing today, and what are your plans um, when you speak on behalf of your children? Um, I guess feelings is, is a lot of frustration, um, a lot of anger, and uh, honestly a lot of confusion. I'm not really even sure how we get to this point in something like this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, on, in, in terms of speaking on their behalf, it's the first time that they'll be heard from. It's the first time that anyone has a chance to represent them in the courts. They're barely even mentioned. It's just kind of the state versus Catherine. Right. And it's almost like they don't matter when we walk in those walls. So uh, that's kind of the goal today is to give them representation and give them a voice. In the years that um, you've jo joined us, uh, Troy, I've just always been very um, moved by your optimism here. How are you feeling now after all these years about what happened to your children? Um. It's indescribable, you know, to, to have your kids taken from you that way and to have them be so young and, and just be gone. But at the same time, you know, we, we're not going to give up on them. We're going to continue um, to fight for them and, quite frankly, moving forward, fight to make sure that other kids, other, um, other victims in this type of situation right. aren't, don't have less rights than the person who, who has victimized them. In, in, in all these years, ha have any credible um, accounts or anybody calling in with tips come in to say, yeah, actually the children, she did take them to somebody's and I, I don't know where they are now, but any credible No, there's, no there's nothing credible for that. There's, it's not, I don't believe it's a logical conclusion at this point. Okay. Um, like I've said in the past, you know, it, you, no father ever wants to, to admit that his kids are gone, but at this point it's... It's the logical conclusion is that Catherine killed my children. And we, I mean, as far as credible tips go, uh, the most credible thing that, that's out there would be that she has at some point said that to someone. So today, the argument will be made by her uh, lawyers that she should be set free. It'll be, it'll be to drop the charges. Mm -hmm. um, as far as her being set free, I guess that would be on Perkins if they were going to civilly commit her or not. Okay. It depends on how, if they deem her a danger to herself or others. Uh, we believe that she's been manipulating the system and the people around her the entire time. So, do you believe that? Oh, 100%. Why do you say that? Uh, I've, I had conversations with her over the first few years, and she's always known everything that kind of she che as we put it she check marks all the boxes to be confident she understands what's going on in the courts she understands who everyone is what she's charged with what the consequences are uh she's fully capable they're saying she's not capable of helping in her defense she's fully capable of um assisting in her own defense she she would tell me on the phone i can't talk about that this is what i can talk about or okay. um it's just it's just very frustrating if the charges are dropped, what would you like to see happen to uh, Catherine Hoggle moving forward? Um, what I would like to see happen is that they would be repressed as soon as, you know, as soon as there's a chance to bring her to competency or to show that she is competent. What will your um, testimony be today when you get the chance to speak? Um, it's going to be... Primarily, I guess it would be about about the fact that 
that they haven't had a voice in this whole situation. They're the victims and they haven't had a voice. That, you know, my, my fear is that the courts are gonna allow this person who's manipulated the system to further manipulate the system to the point to where one day she's walking around and, and she's free and now, now my older son is in danger. Um, that's the, kind of it's the primary goal, you know, is to is to defend the rights and protect Sarah and Jacob in a way and to protect their older brother who's home. And all of this, this court proceeding and the rest of it still does not answer the question, as my colleague Melanie Allen phrased in, out in the field today covering this, of where the kids are. What happened to the kids? No, and she refuses to say to this day. Uh, she still hasn't said. And it, it, I mean, no one is... It doesn't feel like anyone is trying to help get there um, outside of, you know, we have our supporters and things like that. And, you know, and, and as I've said in the past, you know, I appreciate you guys. The local media has been amazing with helping me keep them out there. But the people who have the power to help the people, you know, who would be expected to help, no one's helping. Right. Um, Troy, we'll be there today covering um, the proceedings and uh, we will speak with you again. Thank, thank you for you. joining us this morning. Yeah, the, only, um, the one thing I'd like to say is just I'd like to thank everyone who has supported us. And, you know, at 1230, we'll be gathering in front of the courthouse to, to pray that the, that the judge um, gains the wisdom to make the right choice mm -hmm. and um, that my, my kids will be heard. Thank the judge stated that the time limit since the charges where she could still be restored had not passed and the appeal was dismissed and the murder charges remained. Troy had said that through all of this, the hardest thing for him is that it seems as if Sarah and Jacob are being forgotten. In the system, they are not even mentioned in the courtroom. No one is trying to find out where they are or what happened to them anymore. It's always the state versus Catherine Hoggle. It's always about her competency and never about what happened to the kids. The fact that charges could ever be dropped and her being set free without facing any charges is just unimaginable. But it remains a reality. As I'm filming this, we are currently in August 2022. And on 7th September, it will be 8 years since Sarah and Jacob have disappeared. With still no clear answers from Catherine on where they are. Except for her saying that she left them with someone and that they are safe. We are also coming up on the fifth year of Catherine being in the hospital under the charges with no trial having taken place due to her still being deemed unfit to stand trial. The fear for everyone is that if these charges against her are dropped when the five-year mark is reached, she won't remain in a facility indefinitely. She could be released at any time and therefore the fear is that she might try to do something to their older child if she is ever released. Catherine appeared in court again on the 4th of August 2022 to determine competency. The judge stated that he was not ready to determine whether she was competent to stand trial for murder. And he said that he wanted to hear testimony from some of the forensic psychiatrists who examined Catherine Hoggle rather than rely only on the many written reports assessing her competency to stand trial. He stated that he will not make a decision based on only paper. Her attorney argued that 19 doctors' opinions in a row found that Hoggle was incompetent to stand trial, and it was also deemed in the latest reports that she was unrestorable. He also argued that it was up to prosecutors to show Hoggle is competent to assist in her own defense and that there was no affirmative evidence of competency that has been provided. The state's attorney stated that Catherine Hoggle fully understood her legal situation and was making the considered decisions of a person competent to stand trial. She was working, she was considering, and she has been consulting with a lawyer, which is perfectly logical and stated that these are not the actions of an incompetent individual. The judge has set a tentative hearing date for October 7, 2022 and asked both sides to submit possible questions and areas to explore if he does speak to Catherine. He also indicated that during the hearing, they would be able to call witnesses. After the hearing, Troy said, the hearing went a lot better than he thought it would saying that he appreciated the judges wanting to learn more. 
Outside the courthouse, people held signs bearing slogans and the pictures of the children, calling for a change to the law that requires felony charges to be dropped if a defendant is found incompetent for five years. They said they think the period should be 10 years in certain cases. As of today, there is still no clear evidence on whether Jacob and Sarah are alive or dead. But with the amount of time that had passed and according to the family, things that have come out over the years, the children are presumed as passed away. Jacob would be 10 on 3 July and Sarah would be 12 on 30 November. I know I'm just a lowly old YouTuber from South Africa and my reach is not far, but I urge you to spread awareness on this case, especially if you are watching this and you are from America. It is unimaginable that no one knows anything or saw anything. All the family want are answers and for their babies to be brought back to them, no matter the condition they are in. These kids need to be brought back to their family so that the family can start to heal. And Catherine needs to face what she did. It has been almost eight years and there is still no closure on this case. I have linked all the numbers that you can call, the Facebook page, the Twitter and Instagram handles in the description below. Please also use the hashtag Justice for Sarah and Jacob. And if you would like to make any donations to assist the family, I have also linked their GoFundMe page below. Now let's talk about some of the theories that have been brought up over the years. Theory 1. Catherine was having a psychotic episode or delusion and she killed the children and she doesn't remember and likely wouldn't be able to. Catherine had a long history of mental illness. Her father Randy told the authorities that when the kids went missing, Catherine had been off her meds for two weeks. This has never been confirmed and by all accounts she went for regular doctor visits. Troy Turner and her family later claimed that at the time the children disappeared that Catherine had been doing really well. The best that she had in fact been since she was committed in 2013. Her attorney however states that based on the extent of her mental illness, even if she is found competent at some point, it isn't necessarily reasonable to expect her to be able to know or understand or identify or remember where Sarah and Jacob actually were. He stated that at the time, she was in the throes of a mental illness. And at times, she did not even know the difference between a hallucination and reality. So, she might never be able to provide any clear answers. I don't think that it's just a, a one-stop you know, treatment. Um, I think it's very complicated, so I don't know. All we can do is appeal to both Catherine and to, and to the press and to the, you know, the public, to everyone, to say we want to find these children and we want them home. Theory 2. Catherine had plotted to take her children's lives and was executing a clear plan and she was lucid. The strongest piece of evidence supporting that this was premeditated is that the children went missing one by one from separate areas at separate times. Jacob disappeared first and then she returned home with a story about where he was to avoid suspicion. And then Sarah disappeared. Similarly, she created a story to avoid suspicion. Then, there is also the fact that Catherine became very upset once their oldest child was taken by her mother while they went looking for the other kids. Troy believes that once her mother had their oldest child, she realized that she wouldn't be able to do whatever she'd done with Sarah and Jacob and her plan was foiled, which is when she freaked out and got really upset. He also feels that this might be why she fled from the Chick-fil-A, because she soon realized that her plan would not be completed since their oldest child was safely with his grandmother, and with them now away that the other two were missing, they would not leave her alone with the older, so she could remove him as well. Troy stated that his biggest fear is for his older child if Catherine is released. He states that police felt like she was coming back for him and that if she is released, this might in fact happen. No one will necessarily know what she is doing or where she would show up and when. 
On the podcast Missing Pieces, What Happened to Sarah and Jacob Hoggle, a doctor was interviewed and he stated that it is possible for someone to both carry out a goal-related crime while not being motivated by real events or under the influence of a hallucination. He said that having a lucid plan and knowing where you are doesn't mean that your reasons for being there are based in reality. A lot of people, especially Troy, believe that Catherine is faking her incompetency, that she is playing at being incompetent to stay in the hospital instead of going to prison. Troy also says that he feels that her attorney is training her on remaining mentally incompetent. And he definitely feels that he knows what happened to their children. A psychiatrist was also interviewed and said that it was possible that someone could fake something like one of these disorders, but maintaining it for a long period of time it's much more difficult and not very likely. He said that it was not outside the realm of possibility, that someone could do it long term, but it would be very difficult. He explained that if they had doubts, they would admit the patient to a hospital specifically to keep them under observation for 24 hours straight. This is because it is hard to maintain a fake disorder over a long period of time, while being under constant watch by people who are trained in what to look for. But what would the motive be? No one really knows. But some say that it might have been for revenge, because Troy had her committed. And due to this, she had limited control over her own life. To get away with murder in the state of Maryland. I think that's something that people aren't really looking at, is she's laid a blueprint to get away with it. Theory 3. Catherine's story is in fact true. She gave the children to someone she trusted, and they are presumably safe and being taken care of. Catherine has claimed repeatedly that the children are safe and that she had left them with someone that she trusts. Troy Turner mentioned the last time he had spoken to Catherine about the children, he again asked her where they were, and claims that she said, I gave them to someone, someone has the kids. She reiterated that they are alive, and this person was taking care of them. She also told him that the person is someone that she trusts. No one knows who this person might be though, and no evidence has been found to suggest that she did speak to anyone specifically up to the period where she took the children. Is this possible? Yes, although it seems unlikely considering how much time has passed and how much this case was featured in the media. Is it possible that someone preyed on a mentally ill woman and convinced her that her children would be better off given away to strangers? Sure, but there is no evidence of that, or that the children were alive after their initial disappearance. As a result, it doesn't seem likely that this in fact happened. But Catherine, however, continues to claim that this is in fact what happened. Theory 4. Catherine was planning on running away with her children, which is why she tried to extricate them one by one. This theory was only mentioned once or twice, and it doesn't seem overly likely based on the resources available to her. But if she believed that she could do this, Perhaps she had taken Sarah and Jacob to a location to wait for her to return with their oldest. Whether or not she returned during her four days missing, or if she even remembered where her children were waiting, would be completely unknown. But that seems to be the least likely theory out there. So that is all the information that I have on the case for today. I will keep my eye on the happenings going forward and will post an update if I do find anything. The fact that there are no answers to what actually happened leaves this family unhealed. I understand that Catherine has a mental illness, but there are many people with mental illnesses that never commit violent crimes. What are your thoughts on this case? What do you think about Catherine and the information that she has in fact provided? Do you feel that she is faking her mental illness? Do you feel the children are still alive? Do you feel the story that she told is true? This all makes me so sad and angry at the same time. As always, thank you so much for watching this video. I really do appreciate you so very much. Please remember to leave a like and subscribe if you have not done so already. 
I hope you have a great rest of the day and please stay safe out there. Until next time, bye!